Welcome to Slayer Fest 98. I'm Ian Carlos Crawford. I'm Kimberly Ann Southwick. I'm Ryan Houlihan, and today we are here to chat with the author of The Magicians, Lev Grossman. Hello, Lev. Thank Thanks, you for guys. joining us. <laughs> it is so good to be here. Um, it is nice. This time I'm seeing your face. We recorded before. Um, that was, God, I think, dur- was that during lockdown or like right before lockdown? Mm, it might have been lockdown. It was, uh, uh, and anyway, another geological era from now. <laughs> A blur. Like ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are in Australia now, right? Just like for the time being? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, uh, my wife is Australian and okay. she missed her family. Uh, and so we moved, having lived in New York for 20 years, we um, we moved to Sydney um, about a year ago. And so here we are. Oh, I thought you were like, just happened to be there for like work or something at the, for the time. Huh. Do you feel I, I, like I, as a father, it's hard to live up to a bandit from Bluey, especially now that you live in Australia? <laughs> It's a shadow that really falls over all Australian parents, um, <laughs> but we, you know, we 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 uh, we carry on as best we can. Understandable. <laughs> um, so I figure usually I have people give like their origin. I guess tell us like how you came up with the idea for the magicians. Like what what like struck you to what start drugs it? were you on? <laughs> <laughs> um, I. It's, uh, it's 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 fun to talk about this because I have not answered this question for a while and I used to be very good at it and now um, I'm I'm uh, I'm having to come up with the answer all over again uh, <laughs> and really think it through. Um, I started writing. I came up with the idea for the magicians. It was in two thousand and four, um, and at that time, uh, the magicians was not my first novel. I had written two novels previous to that, um, and they were not very successful um and uh i was in kind of a dark place feeling like i felt like i i wanted to be a writer that was what i felt like i was here to do um but i just was not finding the way to let my voice out um and i was casting about for something and uh i had always been a really intense fan of fantasy um and uh but I had never tried to write it uh, myself um, uh, for uh, all kinds of reasons, uh, including the fact that my parents are both English professors and they uh, have always frowned on fantasy. I do not consider it respectful. <laughs> um, but uh, I, it, you know, I, I, I felt like uh, I, I, I love fantasy novels so much. And I particularly love this, the branch of fantasy that was not sort of the, big sort of epic Tolkien fantasy and the uh, the George R. R. Martin stuff, um, but more um, the co- kind of the cozy stuff, the Narnia stuff, um, uh, more like uh, Philip Pullman, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and Harry Potter, of course. 2004, we were in really peak Harry Potter time, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was just uh, pervading everybody's thoughts. Um, and almost as kind of... A, a thought experiment, I started to play with the idea of, of writing a story kind of like that, like uh, uh, about somebody who is discovering that they have um, magical powers and, and uh, going through that kind of education. Um, uh, and uh, if I wanted to tell that story and I wanted to tell it for adults and kind of marry it to the kinds of feelings that I was having about my own life, um, what would it look like? Um, uh, and of course, uh, you know, it came up, it came out uh, 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 in this, what to me was this very interesting way where um, the characters were older, uh, uh, um, they talked like college students, um, they swore all the time and they had sex and they got drunk. Um, uh, and, you know, they didn't have, I think the things that they did not have was they didn't have a kind of Dumbledore figure in their life. The school has a head, which is, which is, um, Dean Fogg, uh, but he was not avuncular in that way that Dumbledore is. And he wasn't always there to, if they had problems that he, they would have a little chat with him and he would explain what was going on. Um, he did not seem to know what was going on any more than the, the kids did. Um, and then and the other part of it really was that there wasn't uh, particularly a Voldemort figure um, who was kind of organizing the narrative, uh, 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 you know, and who was the, the, um, the arch 
antagonist. And so the characters were left very much kind of on their own in this kind of lost place where they weren't so much trying to save the world, but they were more just trying to figure out we have all this power, we, we sort of have been singled out as special people, we're magicians, um, but why? What is all this power that we have for? Um, and that is kind of the story that I set out to tell. Um, uh, and it was very, I, I c connected with the story so powerfully right away. And I wrote it really quickly in a way that I never had before. Um, uh, and with so much uh, pleasure. At the time, it seemed, it seemed, it seemed weirder then than it does now. Um, it was unusual to have, uh, for example, a gay character in a fantasy novel at that time. Yeah. The idea of dark, dark academia, that was not a phrase that existed at that time. Um, so it seemed in this funny thing, it seemed, it, it seemed weird. Um, and yet, uh, uh, I, when as soon as I started telling the story, I couldn't, I couldn't tell any other story. Did you, did you always plan it to be three books? I um I, I want to say yes, but that would be an untruth. <laughs> uh, uh, the truth is, um, uh, I wrote the first story, first book, really only ever thinking of it as a one-off. Um, and it wasn't until after it was published that uh, that sort of little unit in my brain, which keeps asking the question, well, what happened after that, started ticking over again. And uh, I realized that... Um, uh, you know, Quentin was not done on his journey. He was, he had not really kind of self-actuated in that way that you want your protagonist to do at the end of the story. Uh, he was still kind of a jerk uh, and uh, <laughs> emotionally emotionally underdeveloped. Um, but uh, our jerk. The... <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> a lovable um, jerk. Uh, uh, you know, there were, uh, uh, curse me, that there were several large plot holes in The Magicians, which really it would be good to, to go back and address in, in, in the next book so that... Um, people could have the impression I knew what I was doing all along. <laughs> um, uh, and once I read a, a, a second book, um, I had to write a third book. Yeah. So uh, Zadie Smith in this article on The Believer that I constantly am showing my creative writing students uh, talks about how there's two types of writers. Obviously, there's like 12 million types of writers. But for this essay's purposes, uh, she talks about how there's gardeners and there's architects. And the architects, they right. have like all the blueprints and they know exactly when all their characters are like scheduled to go to the bathroom and everything. And then the, the gardeners are more like, let's see what happens if we plant this here. Uh, where do you, which, which uh, category do you think you fall more under? Cause it sounds like you, you started as, as a gardener with it just kind of coming really quickly, but then you looked back at it and maybe kind of had to be an architect for the second two. Um, uh, yeah, I think, it, well, I, I was probably more architecty than I'm letting on about, about okay. the first book. <laughs> and I, I will add parenthetically, I love that essay so much. It is the <clears throat> by far the most convincing account of what it is like to write a novel that I've ever heard. I, 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 I give it to everybody um, right uh, who wants to know about that stuff. Um, I, uh, my, my self-confidence as a writer was, 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 was really low at that time. Um, and I, uh, you know, when you're feeling confident as a writer, that's when you start, you get gardening because you're sort of like, I can improvise. I know that uh, when the moment comes, uh, when I finish this chapter, I'm going to know what comes in the next chapter. Um, I didn't have that feeling of confidence. So I really had to go and do like a, 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 an outline of the book um, before I got too far into it, um, just to make sure that I knew where it was that I was heading um, in case when I got there, um, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> That's I, I I'm always interested in like how different people write di like so you know at the time when the magicians came out, which I feel like I don't know I don't know that it's like you know it was always compared to Harry Potter, right? I remember I bought it for Kim and I for Christmas the year it came out because I saw mm -hmm. io Nine had done a write up of it saying like adult Harry Potter. Right. <laughs> and that literally, I think I pre-ordered the book when I saw that because I was like, ooh, Kim and I can read this right. together. Like, I'm gonna get that for Christmas because we used to always buy each other books that like we both wanted to read together because we've been friends for a hundred years. Um, and like, do you, I, I kept thinking about this because I don't think it's that much like Harry Potter. Like, I think like, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned Narnia and like Ryan has mentioned Narnia talking about the series as well. And I do feel like that's more apt and they just like happen to be at a magic school. So the Harry Potter comparisons will happen, but I feel like it's so different. What do you feel about that? Um, it, it is very different. And um, 
the Harry Potter sort of comparisons were unavoidable. Uh, right. um, so we didn't avoid them uh, as it turned out. Um, <laughs> but, you know, really the, the book that was, was uh, that was overwhelmingly present for me at that time while I was writing um, was neither uh, the Narnia books nor Harry Potter. It was Brideshead Revisited um, by Evelyn Waugh, uh, which is probably having a moment because of Saltburn is a big riff on, on yeah. uh, Brideshead Revisited. Um, but if you read Brideshead, uh, uh, which is one of my favorite novels, um, it has that identical structure uh, where you have these kids who are at school and it's a kind of an idyll and, um, uh, uh, um, you know, they're learning all this cool stuff and having this education um, and then they leave school and the second half of the book is what happens to them afterwards. Um, and uh, they have all kinds of problems once they try to enter the, the real world. And it was, it's sort of an enchantment, disenchantment story. Um, uh, and that was, you know, that was overwhelmingly what was in my mind. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact that it took on the, 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 the sort of, uh, um, it roped in a lot of Harry Potter-ness um, was, uh, it was fun. It was this narrative that was so, present in the culture at that time uh and yeah. which i uh, uh i didn't read it as a child because i'm too old to have done that but um uh so i didn't fall in love with it exactly but um i really liked it um uh, i found it very compelling and um the the the, the idea of kind of working with it it's, it's sort of in the same way that uh, alan moore did with um superhero stories in watchmen um the idea of kind of taking it and turning certain aspects of it upside down um uh, uh, was very appealing to me. Which also got made into an excellent television show. Yeah, uh, that's true. Totally, it did. Totally different than the <laughs> the book. I mean, the movie's not so much, but yeah. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the books, and one of the things that really drew me in as like a differentiator at the time, and definitely like made me feel much more complicated things than other urban fantasy or like even more like fantastical fillery elements um, style books. And I think part of it was like the plot structure is so interesting because you created this world where basically anything's possible and you removed the like restriction that everyone finds frustrating, which is like on Sabrina or on like Harry Potter, infinite things are possible and nobody seems to have any ambition <laughs> like there's like nothing to be done with it like and so people at home are left on message boards being like i would do this and i would do that and i wonder if this exists and in your world especially like i think if i look at the plot elements laid out chronologically rather than reading the text and like having it hit you and chewing through it it's more like anything can happen like it is much more like this piece comes in and you're like that's so cool that that exists and this other like set piece comes in and like there's an emotional beat here that's sort of encapsulated. And because anything can happen, it's really dense. So all of which to say, like my my question is like, how do you say no to stuff? Like where, where you're like, <laughs> okay, my constraints don't exist and they don't exist for my characters. And that's fun, right? And I'm sure you have books and books worth of ideas and I'm sure we'll eventually get to begging you to like make <laughs> a bunch more stuff in the universe, but like <laughs> beyond even the comics, like, but... Like, how, how do you just throw stuff out? Because I was just saying, I have, like, notes for a novel and I can never delete anything from them. <laughs> um, it's funny. I mean, I, I, I wanted to create that. I mean, Harry Potter takes place very clearly with a lot of guardrails. Um, you know, there are certain things that you know are not going to happen. Uh, and my hope was to create this feeling like this is, it, it, this is that kind of world, but the guardrails are taken off and people are going to explore all that stuff that um, uh, Rowling just uh, um, politely averts her gaze from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then, uh, then again, with any story uh, that has magic in it, you have to be sure that the magic is not going to solve all the problems because then you haven't got any story. Uh, so there mm -hmm. have to be, um, you have to, you have to weave in constraints um, uh, uh, in ways that are hopefully kind of subtle. Um, uh, I can remember there's a uh, doing the bit about how there's a constraint that uh, you can't use magic to um, uh, uh, alter your uh, uh, appearance permanently. I because re I remembered in Harry Potter when um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Hermione is getting uh, um, fixed after the uh, her polyjuice yeah. uh, potion problem, um, 
and she has the um, uh, the nurse uh, when she's putting the, her front teeth back. She kind of makes them a little bit smaller. And I remember thinking, "Oh my God, you can do that!" <laughs> Nobody would do anything else but tweak their <laughs> facial appearance uh, uh, if that were. By the possible. way, um, can't imagine trans people <laughs> could that couldn't enter the world. Of, okay, just had to say that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was thinking Ryan. I was like, "Oh, Ryan, I know Ryan's gonna." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> I said it. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, um, you know, I, I, I ended up weaving in little constraints like that. Um, um, uh, but then in other places, um, I tried to just push the edges of the universe out a little further um, in those directions, which everybody kind of secretly wants them to go, um, um, but hadn't actually been done. Well, and I think you doing that, like, also helps the show because, like, otherwise you just magic solves everything, right? And, like, then there's not really a lot of tension. If magic can just solve every, like, fucking problem that comes at them, then it's like, okay, well, just going to magic your way. And I do think that was, like, really smart because then it's, like, the difference between, like, kind of, like, superheroes and, like, real people who just happen to have, like, powers but still exist kind of, like, in the real world, right? And, and the other the other part of it becomes um, uh, uh, it becomes about the problems that magic can't solve, which are sort of the ones located here. Um, uh, uh, they uh, it, it shifts the emphasis back to the stuff that magic doesn't get uh, uh, traction on. Of course, it probably would be possible to have magic that alters your mood. But again, one of those things I didn't want to get to because uh, uh, it would have screwed up the, 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 the flow of the story completely. Um, but I did want to sort of um, uh, have the characters be thrown back on the stuff that they carry with them um, that mm. magic can't touch. Um, because I feel like um, uh, if, I, if I were actually a magician, um, I would take care of a bunch of stuff immediately um, and then be left thinking, wait a minute, I, I still don't feel that amazing. Mm. That's true. They, I feel like, right, that's like when you're depressed and you think like, oh, this thing will make me feel so much better. And then you're like, oh, fuck, I don't really feel that much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting that like the characters deal with those themes, too. It's not just like they're offered infinite power or like advantages that, you know, sometimes they take, sometimes they don't. But, you know, there's a increasing amount of reflection on like, what do what would I even want? that for or like what what would that give me and sometimes it is something you could like save the world and other times it's like i don't really have anything to do with this it would just be sick <laughs> <laughs> well also the the magic in in the world does the opposite of solve problems for many of them like it creates literally <clears throat> creates like the the major conflicts and also a lot of the the minor conflicts that the characters which some of them aren't minor at all i don't know why i'm saying that but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like the magic also create the magic they themselves do, and then the magic that exists in the world that they are now a part of uh, creates the problems as well. So there's, it's like ma magic exists, but it doesn't really actually solve anything because nothing solves anything. Everything just creates more problems. Wow, that's a really depressing way to look at it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> it creates both good and bad things. This isn't a question at all. By <laughs> <laughs> way. So I am curious. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, 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 please. I was just going to say, I'm curious, like, did you pitch magicians as a show or did like, were you, was it brought to you as like, oh, we'd like to adapt this? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to cast my mind back as to what, <laughs> what actually happened. Um, it was <laughs> definitely not the case that uh, um, the, um, there was, there, that there was interest right away. Um, uh, now I find that if, um, <clears throat> Something is it all a book is it all has a, a, even a tiny scrap of screen potential. Um, it will be snapped up before it is published. Um, but in the case of uh, the magicians, it wasn't until <clears throat> uh, a few years after it came out um, that people started nibbling around the edges of it. Um, I think that fantasy, for all the success that Harry Potter had had at that point, <clears throat> fantasy was still not that legible to um, the kind of kinds of people who um, run yeah. studios mm. uh, uh, and, 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 and production companies. Um, and so it took, uh, it took a little while for people to um, take notice of it. Uh, and then it, 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 it um, 
even then uh, um, it would get picked up and then um, uh, and then the project would be canceled again um, <clears throat> repeated like that it, it must have happened five or six times um, oh I really do with magicians oh yeah I huh. even sci-fi it uh, had 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 begun developing a magician show several years prior and then killed it again um, mm. So uh, it it had really uh, made the rounds, and when um, uh, uh, and and you know <clears throat> uh, when when a, a book has made the rounds and not been developed into something, uh, the agents will say it's been exposed. It's mm. been exposed to the marketplace, and there and the implication it is tainted, and nothing will ever happen <laughs> with it. And it was in a very exposed state um, when uh, uh, Sarah and John came around uh, looking at it. Um, and I had, um, uh, I had, I had not thought anything was going to happen with it. Um, uh, and it was Sarah and John who, um, uh, who made it happen. Um, and they did the pitching, they did everything. Um, they came to us and, uh, um, just all made it work. Yeah. It seems so often people I know who have novels, like almost immediately after, they're published will be like oh it got optioned for tv or somebody bought the tv rights for it or something <clears> and then just there's never a tv show that comes out of it and i get all excited for them and then i, I realize now i have to temper that excitement yeah. so often you know it's it's just interesting it's an interesting like business world that as a like, i'm a poet right i don't even have to worry about that that as a poet <laughs> i don't really think about um you your parents though are both writers they're not just professors and i I saw that pretty much everyone in your family is an artist, which is interesting. Uh, so do you want to talk a little bit about that, <laughs> about being in such a being like the pressure of that family? And maybe because they were because they are writers, did you have some like sense of business sense for any of this when it happened? Or was <laughs> you're you're kind of the first person who this all happened to? Well, I mean, uh, it's it's funny. My, I mean, my father uh, was a poet. Um and so uh, uh, I alluded to him as if he was alive. He's not actually alive, but he was a poet um, and published probably a dozen books of poetry. Um, uh, uh, and he, you know, existed in a very non and in, in possibly anti-commercial sort of state of mind with respect to his work. He felt as though if his work had become commercially successful, then it would there would have been something terribly wrong with it. Uh -huh. um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, my. Mama is a writer who uh, uh, published a novel and a book of stories, um, very much on the sort of literary side of the tracks. Um, and then I was always on the side of the tracks that I thought that I would I would be on. Um, uh, and uh, I think sometimes some of the energy of the musicians came for me from the knowledge of how much it would irritate my parents, <laughs> what I was doing, uh, uh, which is a powerful motivator. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, there was it was in the air very much, you know, being a writer, trying to be an artist of some kind um, that was always in, the air. in our house. It was always thought of as that would be an important thing that you could do. Um, uh, and yet um, uh, I had to figure out my own way of doing it, um, which uh, ended up being quite different from the way that I think my parents had imagined that I would ever do it if I if I ever became a writer um, and in fact they got to watch me write for a dozen years with um, really minimal success trying to be <laughs> the kind of writer that they had imagined that I would become and it just didn't take. Um, coming from a family that clearly has high standards and is and is uh, let's say like really savvy I wonder like Anytime anyone gives away their work, I have seen some of the best work ever be adapted and it just didn't work. <clears throat> and even the pieces were there and everyone was excited and it wasn't good. Were you nervous at any point in the like creation of the show that no matter what happens, that it could turn out bad? Um, and what was the moment when you knew like, oh, wait, this version is great. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I I can't stress enough that that although it was we it was it's a very artistic family. No one had had any dealings with Hollywood um, uh, uh, in their lives, and so I was as naive as I could be um, when I started down this road, um, including the fact that every time it would get picked up um, uh, by a studio, I would think this is my big break. It's finally mm -hmm. happening, and then I would be crushed when it fell apart. I now understand that it is a big part of the life cycle of, of Hollywood that things get. Yeah started and then die um very frequently like quite a lot 
um, uh, and then um, uh, I had thought that um, uh, that once they had uh, uh, once they had uh, you know once the show got approved and and, and greenlit, um, everyone would come to me and say, "Mr. Grossman, how should the show go? Just <laughs> tell us, and we'll do it." Um, but that wasn't how it happened at all. Um, and uh, there was definitely a period when I was very nervous and I didn't understand some of the things that they were doing, um, uh, including the fact that um, uh, yeah, the book actually doesn't give away that Fillory is a real place for quite a while. That is supposed to be a surprise that is slow played. Um, and it's hard to re even remember now, but the fact that they uh, uh, give that away basically in the first episode of the show um, uh, was to me shocking. Uh, and very wrong-headed, and I couldn't understand why. <laughs> um, li likewise, uh, they um, uh, they basically take the first book and the second book and run them simultaneously, yeah. um, uh, rather than saving book two for a future season. Um, again, I, 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 it was uh, I was on to me, and I didn't really understand that when you that you tell stories differently on TV, um, and when you make their pilot episode you really have to be clear about these are all the pieces that are on the table we're not holding anything back for a super big surprise um you know this is this is the kind of show you're going to get um uh you really have to show everybody that there's all this cool stuff for the for for, for, for them to keep keep up with it um uh yes yeah, and uh, uh i can also remember when um they cast arjun as penny um um, I did not understand that because Arjun is so good looking and charming. <laughs> so, um, so good looking. Penny less so in the book. And they had a, a they had a vision for that character that I I didn't understand at all. Um and I remember just sort of thinking, ah, what's happening? I don't understand. <laughs> um uh, it's not gonna work. But then it um uh, uh, of course it did work and I didn't really get that until um they screened the pilot for me. Um, that was when I kind of understood that um, that they had a vision that was as real and as valid as my own vision. Um, but I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't understood it until until I saw it. So, what uh, did they come to you for? Was there anything like in specific that they asked about? I don't know if we're getting getting into non spoilers <laughs> world yet. If we can, I can ask a question like that and get a. A specific answer. Spoiler, your curious. spoiler warning begins now. <laughs> All How right, your spoiler. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we talked. Uh, we 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 did talk a lot about casting, especially casting Quentin, because um, uh, uh, Jason came along relatively late in the process, and we was clear that it was not going to be a show um, unless we, uh, we unless we got the right Quentin, and yeah. Jason was the only one. Um, we, we said saw that. a lot of people. Yeah. We, we we were just recapping and we had like a five minute conversation being like, this must have been the most difficult role to cast. <laughs> and they nailed it. <laughs> yeah, they did. But it, it took a lot of nailing before it was properly <laughs> nailed. Um, Fair. Uh, they, um, uh, uh, um, they ran through a lot of people and somehow that sense of nerviness, that sense of a really active intelligence that is... Uh, um, uh, where where his head is kind of working all the time, um, sometimes in ways that are counterproductive to his own happiness. Um, somehow people couldn't put that across uh, in that way. Um, uh, but Jason could, and everybody, there was a big sigh of relief when he, <laughs> he signed on and, 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 and we knew that it was, uh, it was going to happen. Can I ask, so the, the, the original book series is obviously you can feel the influence of like several different books and it's not it's in a way that like there's so much commentary and being played with but also inheriting like some stuff that really works the tv show does that with some tv show stuff similarly and like mm. we we know that the staff creating the show is we're big fans of buffy and you know, Summer has told us that like Buffy was a huge part of like the development of her work. And I wonder, mm -hmm. like, was that discussed with you? Have you watched Buffy? I'm not sure, actually. And <laughs> if you have or you or if you haven't, like, did you think that that was the right direction to go in when they like showed you their vision of weekly adventures? 
That was definitely, I, I was a big Buffy fan. Um, uh, it cool. was, I, I actually didn't used to watch a lot of TV, um, but that was the point appointment viewing show. Um, That's the correct opinion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Around um, here. <laughs> and so, uh, at, you know, at, during the time when I was trying to convince people that the book even could be a show, that was um, uh, Exhibit A, uh, which wasn't always necessarily the greatest tool because uh, it was a it was a it was a culty show, and the, right. it's 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 numbers to a to a production executive were not overwhelmingly uh, amazing. Its cultural footprint was enormous, but yeah. um, the actual TV ratings at the time um, people didn't understand. I think in Hollywood how what a big deal it was. Yeah, no, I um, we ha we have um, Emily Nussbaum who got a Pulitzer and like criticism. We've had her on a lot, and she always says Buffy is one of the shows that made her want to write about TV because she would say, oh, Buffy and Sopranos are my favorite. And people would agree that Sopranos are great, but then they'd be like snobby about like, oh, but you like Buffy? And she'd be like, it's also great. Like both can be great. Um, I and remember Howard Stern regularly doing segments about how Buffy was a great show to like <laughs> shock men who would call in and be like, I don't believe you. And then they would call in next thing and be like, that show's amazing. <laughs> and I remember my dad came to me and was like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny because it, Buffy fed into the book a lot, uh, and I, you know, I, I would think about what are ways we can do book equivalents of, uh, of the way of what Buffy's doing, um, and the the way the show just pushed at what was possible, like uh, what you rules that you weren't even aware were rules on TV shows. They would then yeah. figure out that it was a rule, and they would break it. Um, uh, stuff like you know taking away the soundtrack. Um, uh, I was thinking about um, book, and then in a funny way, it got trans retranslated back onto onto TV. So in some ways, it's there was a, it, its destiny was to become a show as well as a book. Um, it was sort of baked into its uh, its DNA. I, um, I and, oh yeah, continue. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to mention that that, that was definitely true for uh, John and Sarah. Um, uh, and it, one thing you can see about the show uh, is that um, uh, it has probably more of a horror vibe than the book does. Um, and it's I think it's because of Buffy and of course because of Supernatural, they were probably more horror people than they were fantasy people. Hmm. Yeah, that's funny. I've mentioned a lot how well the show incorporates, without being straight up horror, how well it incorporates. Because like the beast in the first episode is fucking scary, like with all the moths and like that, like feels very horror to me and i'm a big horror fan i'm that's gail weathers behind me in a painting mm -hmm. um <laughs> the whole series both the book and the tv show this is just me playing a compliment has like a lot of iconic imagery there's a lot of things that like stuck in my head for a while after that i wonder like did those things just come to you and then you were like where can i use that image or were they like creation specific for each instance Oh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a mix. I mean, the whole book started um, because I had a, a dream about the beast. That was the um, the kernel of the of the whole book. Really, it was the first thing that I wrote, um, uh, uh, and then I went back and started filling in a story around it. Um, so certainly, those visuals, which were of course changed for the show in a really effective way with the moths, um, uh, that visual image. Was it was it was you know very alive for me. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other things that came to me visually first. This all happened a really long time ago. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, people will bring up something uh, yeah. I said on like two podcast episodes ago, and I don't remember. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I can't, I, I can't think of other examples. I think there was certainly there. I'm sure there were images that I, I wrote towards, and I sort of thought. In the story, we have to get to the place where they see this or this tableau appears. Um, and then other stuff probably just came to me uh, as I was writing. I am a very visual writer. Um, uh, I'm running the movie in my head while I'm while I'm writing the words. Uh, so it is sort of natural that visual stuff should um, come out of it. And I have to ask about... Um... You know, Summer Bischel has been co-hosting with us for Angel. She's been like on for a lot of the episodes and she does talk a lot about how Cordelia very much influenced like how she portrayed Margot um, and that like Sarah Gamble had kind of encouraged that, right? Like um, I'm curious about how 
how did Margot come to be? Because she's kind of Janet, but kind of like she's more bombastic. Maybe would be the word. Um, <laughs> she's a riff on Janet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm curious how you like got from like book Janet to like then to like you progress to Margot. Like how did that happen? Uh, I, I mean, I, I really must stress that 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 uh, uh, this wait. I talk to the writers all the time. Uh, uh, I talk to Sarah and John, uh, but you know this stuff. Uh, Margot comes comes from them, uh, uh, and I'm sure I cheered them on. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, I feel like Margot is Janet's sort of natural final form, uh, and because um, uh, I'm not as funny as those guys. Um, <laughs> And I'm not as good at writing women as those guys. Uh, and, uh, it was natural for them to take Janet the rest of the way to be Margot. Um, uh, but I love Margot and I wish I could feed her back into the books um, <laughs> and, and have her be there. Uh, that was one of the aspects of the show that got to places that I, I, I longed to go but couldn't get there on my own. Did you ever get jealous of like, oh, I wish that I could have had a little more time with these characters because... The TV show gives you an excuse to be like, we're doing a whole musical episode and this whole section of we're going to suspend the serialization for a week. And you're like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, did, were you ever really jealous of their freedom in that regard? Oh, sure. I, I, it's, it's funny about the musical episodes because the first time they did it, um, I think they were a little nervous coming to me with it. Um, because <laughs> uh, uh, there had been moments in the in the in the course of the show when I actually sort of said, I get it, I get it, but I would not do it that way. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I think that they were expecting one of those from the musical stuff. Um, little did I, they know that I had, I, think I did a little theater in high school. Um, <laughs> I've been in a lot of musicals uh, and um, I just adored it uh, so much. And I wish that I, you could have music in books because um, <laughs> uh, uh, if, they, if you could, I would. I mean, it is, I do think it's impressive because I don't think it always works when shows try to do a musical episode, but mm -hmm. it does always work in The Magicians when there's a musical number or a musical episode. Yeah. Um, I We were just talking about um, the Taylor Swift bit in season one, and I looked up how like <laughs> they went over budget just like buying the song to use for those like no. 10 seconds. Because <laughs> she needs it's the money, I mean. Yeah. It, would, yeah. it would cost so much more now. Oh my yeah. God. Oh my God! I know, right? Yeah, we got in um, the market. The market was still low at the time. Uh, even then, it was I, I can't remember how much it was. It fifty thousand. Fifty thousand dollars. I looked it up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Seems like, like a, a ringtone. Because but... <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'm curious, like when they were when like I mean, they, you said they did talk to you a lot. Did you all like kind of because it sci-fi shows don't normally last this as long as the magicians did. Right. Um, mm. Did y'all like, and I know that when uh, season five came around, Sarah Gamble did say that they did write the like finale to be a finale, even though they weren't positive. Um, was that kind of like, do you know, like, I don't know. Was there like a two season arc and then you're like, Oh, we got more cool. Or was it like, kind of like always have to be like, let's tell the story and then we'll see. Um, I mean, it was definitely season by season, but there would be a point in this, in, in while well, the show was on the air when sci-fi would re-up. Um, but I think they were never a hundred percent sure that there was going to be another, another season. Um, uh, there was always that, um, uh, there was always that uncertainty. Um, yeah. Selma and John, uh, Sarah and John are not lacking in self-confidence. So <laughs> they were always, you know, uh, uh, they always sort of assumed it would keep going um but you know uh we never we, we never know for sure and it, like as with buffy it was not a runaway hit ratings wise um it was it, you know it was solid especially by sci-fi standards um yeah uh but you know it was never sort of like uh it was never it wasn't game of thrones <laughs> fair <laughs> so i, I will say, say go ahead brian i was gonna say i will say similar to shows like suits I feel like people, he I hear a lot of people really get into the show via streaming and binge watching, um, even though it's wrapped. And a lot of them, because it's wrapped and they know it's a complete story and mm. they know that like yeah. the fandom is really satisfied as opposed to Game of Thrones people, which I don't think there are like a lot of people joining the club. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and <laughs> And I wonder if you've experienced that of like, you know, I mean, is there a real difference 
like I'm sure there is post show of just the amount of people, but do you feel like there's a, a sort of ongoing momentum of people like and and readers coming in? Yeah, de definitely. Or I mean, anecdotally, anyway. I don't uh, I don't <laughs> then look at the numbers, but but um, uh, it, it's it's definitely given the books um, uh, a, a wonderful long tail uh, that you know they wouldn't necessarily have had um, uh, without that. Um, and God bless Netflix's secret algorithm, uh, but <laughs> it keeps uh, putting the show in front of people um, who haven't seen it before. Uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a really nice, when I go to conventions uh, and book festivals, um, uh, uh, you know, I very get, I'm ve I very often uh, meet people who A, just started watching the show and B, had no idea there were books. Um, <laughs> mm. uh, uh, so, it, you know, it, um, it, it's still kind of uh, reaching people. And I think, uh, I hope that it's still in some ways um Fresh and surprising, uh, uh, even though it's a few years old now. I would say it is. Oh, we've been yeah. we've been, we're halfway through covering season one to lift the veil. We've already covered half of it. Um, <laughs> just haven't released them yet. And yes, it very much like, and you know, the three of us we know it all, but it still feels like a fresh thing to talk about. And it doesn't. Nothing I've encountered so far on this rewatch, and I did rewatch the whole season before we started covering it, has felt really particularly dated, honestly. Like, which no, is pretty I impressive. Like it, it's like how I always say Britney Spears is toxic. Sounds like it's from the future, even though it's from like 20 <laughs> years ago. And and I feel like the show still feels like, oh, that's an exciting thing to say. And I'm like, oh, this is a little while ago, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, to oh. Yeah. Oh no, go right ahead. I've been, I've I wanted to ask about that. Elliot because mm. Elliot, like like you said, especially back then, there weren't a lot of like LGBTQ characters in fantasy and sci-fi. And like, you know, growing up a gay nerd, I always wanted there to be like a just one gay character in like my superhero bunch or in my, you know, whatever. And I was what made you like decide to include a character like Elliot, knowing that like there weren't a lot back then? Um uh, it, it was not a decision. I mean, he uh, arrived that way. Um, uh, uh, that was just part of who he is. A part of him is based on um, my, my roommate in college. Um, okay. uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of him is based... Uh, I mentioned Brideshead was a big thing. Sebastian Flight is that character very much. Um, uh, it, was, I, it was definitely not i i didn't think i'm now going to intervene in the fantasy tradition um by uh placing this character here um it was you know it was always just who he was um uh, and it was only fairly late in the process that i began to congratulate myself on my <laughs> progressive step that i've taken in putting this this character in uh, but it, you know at the time it wasn't calculated it was just and uh, if it was calculated the only bit of it i think was probably um what has harry potter what has rolling not done <laughs> uh, 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 and at the time, Dumbledore was still straight as an arrow. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, it seemed uh, exciting and new. That makes that, well. That if you're ever sense, tempted, yeah. I welcome you to retroactively tell us every character was secretly trans. I think that would be a great <laughs> reveal. Just don't like you know do it in the way she did it, where you're correcting <laughs> everyone. <laughs> yeah. And so, wait. Now that you're saying this, the Bridehead's revisited. That's why Elliot's last name is. Wow, right? Is that why? It is. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I forget when that became his last name. I'm not sure we had his last name in the first book. Ah, I can't remember. I now. couldn't remember anyway, that either. So... I didn't want to expose myself and say I didn't remember when that came to play. <laughs> I feel better that you also don't remember. <laughs> I am really not much of an authority on my own work, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> things that I forget all the time. <laughs> so I want to ask, we were talking a little bit before about how every season we didn't know if it was going to be there was going to be another season and you kind of found out halfway through and i i'm guessing you're a star trek fan based on the short description i read of your first book i always say <laughs> yeah. that the stng series finale is like the best ever series finale on television because it gives you like just enough into the future that like you get that satisfaction of everyone's going to be all right. Voyager kind of does this too, but I, I don't think it's as successful. Uh, and you also like get to spend time with all of these characters sitting around that, that poker table. Uh, and all, like all you want from a finale is to just spend, or all I want, 
all I want from a finale is to just spend time <laughs> with these characters that I love before they go off into the ether and live only in my imagination. And then you need a graduation party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I wondered, like, because you're a Star Trek fan, if you know what kind of finale as a as an enter as someone being entertained, not as a writer necessarily that you like, like, do you like that? Like everyone's going to get together and we know this is the end and we're all going to like cheers and congratulate ourselves or there's a lot of ambiguity in the last, <laughs> the very, very last episode of Magicians. Uh, and it's not, it's not satisfying in that same way that the Star Trek Next Generation finale is, though in its own ways, certainly knowing that, like we said, like when you, when you watch the series on Netflix, like, you know, yeah, you know, this the is end. the last step. You, mm-hmm. you know, you're not yeah. getting any more from the show. So, uh, yeah. you know, which, which kind do you prefer? Like, do you wish they'd been able to have another season and or like write a more as I'm calling it, satisfying finale, or were you like, no, yeah, this is this is good. I mean, not novelists. Um, uh, I think it is a common thing about novelists is that is that um, we like ambiguity um, mm. more more than is good for us. Um, mm. uh, if you were to flog yourself through my first two novels, which I don't recommend doing, um, <laughs> you would discover that the endings are. Extremely- extremely unsatisfying um because uh, you know when you're writing a novel uh, there's a strong urge to say just leave it all unsettled because isn't life like that you never know where <laughs> things are going and the story never really ends so um uh the fact that there was a significant amount of uh, uh um uh stuff left open in the in the um magician's finale and um, felt just right to me um i love that um uh, they didn't take as far as the Sopranos, but um, <laughs> uh, I I love the Sopranos finale too. Um, uh, so I have real taste for ambiguity and the just brass band um, conclusion. Uh, uh, there's a lot to be said for it, but it's not what I had dreamed of for the show. Okay, you saying that? I this is going to be random, but have you read Thomas Pynchon's A Crying of Lot Forty Nine? <laughs> I read it as an undergrad. I can't, I can't remember how it ends. Because it, um, it, end like... it ends like the whole story is her trying to figure out what's going on with this company. And she opens the door to the room where all the answers are. And that it op- ends with her opening the door. And I remember in undergrad, that's like the only thing I remember from that book. Because I also read it in undergrad. And I just remember being <laughs> furious that that's how that right. book ended. <laughs> um, no, it's like The Fault in Our Stars, uh, uh, the book within a book of that, which ends in the middle of the sentence. Um, mm. um, all the characters are really annoyed by that. And it's probably is really it would be really annoying <laughs> um, See, i loved how the books ended because i just loved the idea that like either more could come or like i could in my mind start like dreaming of new stuff and and it felt like a great way to like i don't know like it felt like you had so much to say about fantasy especially for someone who hadn't had a ton of engagement professionally with the genre before that um and about sort of like dreaming for dreaming sake and like i i wonder if like did you set out being like this is what i wanted to say with the whole series or did you sort of like like it felt like sometimes the show would let the characters find things that were unexpected or that they it felt like things would emerge over the course of a season of writing and i liked that but i wonder if that was sort of how it happened for you or if you were like this is what i want to say and these are this is who can say it this is who can say it Mm. Um, uh, I, I'm now I'm trying to uh, 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 I'm trying to remember uh, how it happened um, uh, I knew that um, uh, I, I knew that uh, I wanted to uh, end the trilogy um, not not to be too spoilery but I knew I wanted to end it on an, on an up note um uh people had often c- commented uh on uh the, the 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 bleakness of the magicians um and how you know this this the the, the first book then so much loss which is not really fully counterbalanced by um uh the um surviving people you know uh moving along um <laughs> uh, i realized that um <laughs> well it's a funny thing uh, um, so much of my life had been uh, a, a frustration and disappointment up to that time. Um, and the fact that The Magicians was a success as a book, um, it, it did change me a little um, because uh, it was a kind of uh, 
uh, things worked out in a way that nothing had ever worked out for me before. Um, and I, I knew that I wanted the, the books to, to some extent reflect that. Um, I mean, there's something melancholy about fantasy uh, uh, as a genre. Um, and I mean, it's really, it, it's really is dreaming of a world that, 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 that can't be. Um, and that, but yet somehow everybody uh, has this deep longing for. Um, so there's something inherently melancholy about it. Um, but, even, but given that, I wanted to try to find a way uh, where life seemed livable at the end, because um, I had come around to the position after much internal debate that life <laughs> is actually livable. Oh, <laughs> that's that's <laughs> oddly sweet. Yes, I do. I, I love that <laughs> because I think a thing that I I think that's a thing that I love about the series is that it is both. It can show you the bleakness, but it can be like things aren't always bleak um and i mean i keep going back but she's my favorite margot going from the like quote-unquote mean girl to like the destroyer to the creator that for me was like really fucking beautiful and like her being the one that's like okay well i might die here i want to save the world i'm gonna do it anyway and then like not dying i don't know like i remember watching that finale being like oh fuck they're going to kill Margot because this is like a hero's journey, right? She learned what she needed to learn. And then that's yeah. usually in fantasy when the character dies, right? Because like they've had their journey. Um, right. And I appreciated that it she did. Like I clearly wouldn't want her to die because she was my favorite. But I understood if she did die that that was like this was her journey and she needed to save the world. So she died. Sa you know, Buffy, right? Died saving the world. Um, so, yeah. And so like, I don't know. I really appreciated for me, that did a little bit turn that trope, which I feel like you did a lot in the series and they in the book series and they did a lot in the show just in general. Like, here's the trope, but we're going to make it different. We're not going to, like, abide by all of the trope rules. Um, yeah. And would you say that was, like, on purpose with the show, too? I know you said, like, you kind of wanted to do that. Um, I don't know. I never talked to them about that. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the show happened... I was in New York. It was in LA. It was a huge writer's room with a lot of people in it. Um, uh, and sometimes I talked to them about what they were doing and sometimes they didn't. I always saw the scripts ahead of time, um, okay. but I didn't always talk to them about what was the thinking behind it. Um, but I like to think that they were uh, to some extent following the spirit of the books when they did that. And you said um, you see this, uh, sorry, you, you said you saw the script before. That's not the usual right when like a book is adapted into like a movie or series right like sometimes the author has like no say in that right or like doesn't get involved at all yeah and there's I, I have plenty of cases where writers have really felt as though their work was just sort of yeah. hijacked uh and they took the story and they used it to say things that that the author would not necessarily have said um uh and i feel blessed all the time that that that, that was not the case um uh you know i i, I there there were again there were things where um i said don't do that do this and they definitely had their own vision and they stuck to it um uh in a good way sarah and john are real <laughs> control freaks and they really <laughs> had to have the show that they wanted uh they the, the way they wanted it uh even if it wasn't exactly how i wanted it um, have you so seen this random? Is... Just one random question: Have you seen the show Episodes, the HBO show? No, I haven't. No, it's about two TV writers who like are from Europe and they come to Hollywood, and someone makes their show, and it's like very different from the show that they wrote. You just might find it funny. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, um, I this is so random, but I when they were promoting one of the seasons, it might've been season two, they did a pop-up experience in Brooklyn that I went to. Mm. And I yeah. think I did it like twice. It was so cool. They did like all this tech and special effects. And I remember thinking like, when I when I read the book series, like walk through dark ride experience was not the first thing I thought might be like the adaptation. <laughs> and yet it worked great. I still have some of those photos. Um, and I wonder, like, is there an, any other mediums that, like, of course, like, it's a matter of, like, numbers and deals and priorities and stuff. But is there any medium that you think it, the property is really primed for an adaptation to? 
Broadway musical video game. I don't know. But, <laughs> and is there any that you would just never touch with a 10 foot ball that you're just like, I'm good. We don't need like a magician's themed chat bot. Or something. <laughs> Crypto. Um, I'm for some reason, I'm so sure that you could never get a good video game out of the magicians. Um, uh, and, you know, there were conversations about that. Um, and I, at the time I was an avid gamer, I probably kind of fallen away from that a bit. Um, uh, but I was always very skeptical about the idea that you could do anything <clears throat> with it in that medium. Um, I don't know if you've seen the graphic novel that they did, um, uh, which I thought was a very successful um, adaptation. Uh, I was really happy about it. Um, and in fact, it was a lot of legal work to pry loose that gra those graphic novel rights. It took me oh. years, but I was so convinced that, um, that uh, it would be a good idea Huh. to um to do something uh i think partly because um uh, uh watchman was such a uh, a presence for me when i was writing it um uh i really wanted to see it in that medium and i was happy that we got it there um uh you know i, I i've alluded to my love of uh of musicals um <laughs> it would be amazing to see uh, a musical version we probably never will um, but, hey, um, hey! I know uh, how to write a yeah. musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, I would love to see it. Um, uh, um, my brother's a novelist, and um, they actually uh, uh, they never did a show of his first book, um, but they it was adapted as an opera, very strangely. Um, oh, and I um, uh, there is still in me a, a <clears throat> burning coal of envy that um, <laughs> that he got to he got to have that. Um, um uh but i got to have a lot too so it's all good well yeah. i eagerly await the magician slot machine in vegas <laughs> it's going to moth 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 or whatever <laughs> and then you'll have like hail appleman pop up um oh yeah a pinball machine would have been good i i Ooh. that would have been wait that's yeah such not a, a video idea. game but pinball right Mm. I'll meet you in Jersey. We're gonna get this <laughs> and sometimes the weirdest shit has pinball. Like there used to be a bar true. near where I lived in Brooklyn that they had pinball machines. And I'd be like, this weird random eighties movie has a pinball machine. Like, Oh, I've been to pinball museums. They, and they have such great, anyway, we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> my other question is like uh, about, so you've, you, you have a new series of novels out. And I wonder like for you going forward, do you are is, is with your new work? Are you trying to do something you've never done before? Do you try to feel like you want to do something that's a completely different direction, or are you thinking like the people who followed me from this may like this? Um, because I know there's it can be really hard to fall into the next right idea for you, you know. Um, yeah, um, and it, it, it some. Something that annoys me about myself is that um, uh, I tend to be a bit restless as a writer, and 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 I'm constantly trying to to do uh, uh, new things. Part of me uh, um, feels annoyed that I haven't written more magicians' books. Um, <laughs> why can't I just sit in that world and just iterate on it forever? Um, uh, why did I have to write uh, uh, some middle grade novels? Um, uh, why did I have to write a King Arthur novel? Which, you know, it's all in the, broadly speaking, the fantasy yeah. uh, um, um, umbrella. There's, there's, there's always magic in it. You know, there's always that um, that element. Um, and I don't seem to be able to write without it. Um, and yet there's something, uh, uh, for some reason, I, I have this urge to move laterally within fantasy um, and try a bunch of different things. Um, uh, uh i'm writing i'm doing a children's picture book now um oh cool uh um uh for for some I, for some reason my life seems like it's so short to me and i just want to try a whole bunch of different things um but then that. at other times i look at jim butcher or somebody uh, who can who can just stick with a a, a, a premise and just yeah. ring new ideas out of it forever um for some reason i haven't been able to do that it's annoying so I, I annoy myself with that. <laughs> What's your sign? My sign? My star sign? Yeah. I'm a cancer. Okay, interesting. Me too. Because <laughs> Aries were us. like that. We jump from like project to project. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what planets you have in, in Aries, because that's like a very Aries thing or a Sagittarius thing to go from project. I, I can't blame your star sign, so your sun sign. <laughs> can't help you, sorry. 
<laughs> um, so you you have that book coming out this year, then the King Arthur one, yeah. The King Arthur book was uh, which took me a long, long time is finally coming out uh, in July. Uh, so I'm very excited about that, and um, you know, in their ways in which it is quite magiciany, it again has you know uh, this kind of ensemble uh, uh, um, uh, of, of of characters. It's sort of a Scooby Gang uh, of knights that it focuses on. Um, uh, you know, it pu it pushes at. Uh, it, it, I, I like to work in a genre that is established and then kind of push at the edges of it. So, obviously, th there has been a lot of King Arthur, and it's great because there's a lot of rules. King Arthur has a lot of rules in it that you can kind of push at and and mm -hmm. and break. Um, uh, so, it, you know, it is magiciancy in that respect. Um, um, and then, uh, in other ways, not. I, I actually am quite curious as to how people um, who like the magicians will react to it. I don't know if they'll like it or not. I can't tell. I loved the Once in Future King. I read that multiple right. times. I marked the crap out of it up. It's one of the few books that... I, I like, I, when I see that book, I think of you, Kim, because when we were teenagers, that's like, she, all she talked about was that book. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely have to get a hold of, of the one from this, that's coming out. Well, this that was as a magician, my ob obsession as a kid. Oh, um, okay, right I, I never thought I would write about King Arthur because I always thought that those books were so definitive. Um, yeah. And then over time, uh, I, I started to want to poke it with a stick. Um, and I don't know why. Um, but but T.H. White, is, it's always uh, uh, looming in the background. Right on. And, and of course, The Sword in the Stone. <laughs> Disney movie. Yeah. I always heard yeah. about that I, one. A Knight's Tale starring Heath Ledger. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's a, that's a great movie. Medievalists love that movie um, because it gets so much right about the period. Really? Um, no. um, yeah, they do. It's it it is uh, uh, it is it's popular even among medieval scholars. I find I can promise you a sword in a stone um, in the bright sword. Um, <laughs> we do get to that eventually. Awesome. <laughs> Is there any worlds that you like, like, so you've done fantasy and you've commented on a lot of those big, like, universes, and I, and you've got this commentary, I feel like, well, like your own take on, I should say, like, through the, through your lens. Um, and I wonder, is there, does sci-fi ever call to you or superheroes or some other, like, way of storytelling but that has the kind of appeal of magic in there because sci-fi is kind of magical <laughs> yeah yeah i'm a huge science fiction fan I, I i i i um i love it so much um and i think uh in part uh you know i'm I, there uh, um i'm quite intimidated by sci-fi um there are uh writers uh like uh william gibson and ian banks and Neil Stevenson, uh, who have done so much of what I would do if I were a science fiction writer, um, that uh, I feel uh, less of a powerful call. I have been working for a while on a uh, on a graphic novel that is a kind of a space opera. Um, it's very mm -hmm. much in the Star Wars vein, and so Star Wars it's kind of on the edge of science fiction and fantasy, really, um, and this is too. Um, uh, but I, there's definitely uh there's there's uh something there that i that i really want to do and i will do it it turns out that graphic novels it takes a long time to make them so <laughs> even though i'm working on it in the script uh which i'm doing with lila Sergis, who did the uh, uh magician's graphic novel oh and that um, art was beautiful uh, yeah she yeah she well she was the she actually wrote the words um uh uh, I did not actually write the script of uh, of that graphic oh, novel. But she did, and it was so brilliant that um, I asked her to collaborate with me on this. Anyway, it's going to come out. It's not going to come out until twenty twenty seven, I think. Oh, maybe. Sure. Um, anyway, sure. it takes forever. But one day I will have do a, a big science fiction take, um, uh, and it's coming. But it's just coming extremely slowly. My money is earmarked. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Pre order <laughs> put in. <laughs> Have you read Murderbot, the the Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells? Oh yeah, <laughs> I yeah. Feel like that's I was the just same same sort of like awkward, like gritty realism as as the magicians almost. Like yeah, there are a number of characters in the world of literature that I hate myself for not having come up with first. Um, <laughs> I wish that I had come up with Murderbot. Um, it's just too good. Love Murderbot. <laughs> I throw a Murderbot themed Christmas party every year. <laughs> Kim has been trying to get me to read the book. For, I bought you the book, Ian. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's not <laughs> hard to read. Those. It would it reads itself. You know, anyway, once you get started. There we go. From from an uh, author. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now you have to read it. Um, yeah. Also, I just looked at myself and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you, Kim and I, our best friend tattoos are the unity key from the magicians. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's um, I just have a bunch of merch. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> we've been we've been friends for 25 years and Kim had the idea because we were like, oh, it should be something that's like from something we love, but like also symbolizes our friendship. And Kim was like, why don't we do the unity key from the magicians? And I was like, that's a great fucking mm-hmm. idea. So, yeah, we both it is a great fucking idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess I got to ask, I know this is like a whatever question. What are some of your favorite like either bits or episodes from the show? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, um, the, the, definitely the musical episodes, in particular the first one, the One Day More. Uh, I've just watched it so many times. Um, uh, the, the way... I, the way Margot says, like, oh, there were other lines, but we had to skip them. They weren't really relevant here. I like. Yeah. <laughs> Delightful. Um, and Hale just could say, oh, yeah, I did scale the heights. Um, <laughs> it's just, um, uh, it's very wonderful. Um, and I think about it a lot. Um, uh, everybody loves a day in the life. I too love a day in the life. Um, but, you know, th- things that they did. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, the, 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 I, I sometimes forget that the moths aren't in the book because uh, the moths are so good. Um, uh, they really uh, Quentin's are, yeah. last episode. Quentin's Retroactively, last episode, I, they I, are to me. Like when I read the book, <laughs> they're like kind no, of. No, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. They've muscled. Their, they take, they've, they've become sort of, yeah, <laughs> they've become canon. Um, Quentin's last episode is something. I can't say that I rewatch it very often because it is uh, uh, very emotional yeah. for me, but um it's it's very very good the scene where um uh uh uh, penny uh is in the underworld and he's explaining how game of game of thrones ended um but um uh, um for some reason i think about that a lot lot too (laughs) it's so funny (laughs) you know Um, what you know what got me back you know what got me to i had read the first book and i just like i didn't have cable when the show was airing and I like hadn't realized it was on Netflix, but Kim was like, oh, I think you would really like the show. It's like finally on Netflix. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll probably check it out. And then I happened to, I think it was like season three had just started and I saw the clip of them doing the pop culture speak. And that's when I was like, okay, I have to watch this fucking show. Like I have to watch this show. <laughs> it was like after I after I had seen that too, I had texted you again to be yes. like, reminder, <laughs> reminder that and like you 100%, there's a scene in this one episode you're gonna love. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um, that's probably more uh uh there's probably more uh i mean all the stuff that they did at breaks bill south is very very good uh mm-hmm. um uh the s- sweaters they wore man when they uh the show ended i really wanted to get my hands on one of those sweaters they were so good and uh you didn't get one uh, no, i didn't get a sweater <sighs> i didn't get a sweater i know but um uh, that was the one thing I wanted. And I <laughs> yeah, I feel like the styling in general was like always 100% on that show. Like everyone always looked gorgeous. All the outfits like fit everyone perfectly. I still would wear. I'm always like, man, if I were cool enough, I'd dress like Elliot. Like I'm wearing all those like nice fitting suits and like. I kind of wore it in like the early 2000s, right, Kim? That was kind of my like, but. <laughs> when I used to, when I used to visit the set of the show, which I I would do like once a season, I wasn't because it was in Vancouver and that was a long way away. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I used to like to hang out in the wardrobe room um, <laughs> and just quietly page through all the all the outfits that were hanging up. Um, <laughs> that was probably the most unreal thing to me about having the show be actually be made was that. Um, you could see what Elliot was wearing. Um, mm. uh, I am not personally a snappy dresser in any sense, um, <laughs> but I always wished that I was. Um, <laughs> Elliot does that for me. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, the way, and like, even going in season one, it's funny seeing like the way they were styled and then like their style kind of does grow with the characters. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I, I like seeing that. And, like, 
you know, I mean, you mentioned you also watch Buffy. Like, I feel like the fashion in Buffy was always like a big thing. Like you would like pay attention mm -hmm. to like, oh, Buffy wore the, the red leather pants in this episode. Right, right, right. And like, I do kind of do that with the magicians. I'm like, oh yeah, this is this outfit. I love this outfit. Or like, mm -hmm. oh, I wish I could dress this. Or like, oh, I would wear this. Or like, even they're like, Ren, fi Ren Fair outfits in Fillory are fucking gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would look ridiculous yeah. to wear, but they're really well done. <laughs> mm. Mm, yeah. Do you see a lot of stuff like that, um, like fan art and like fan creation stuff that are like riffs on um, images from either the books or the TV show? And uh, and and if you have, have, have any of them stuck themselves in your memory oh gosh um i really um i love fan art um uh a couple of there have been a couple of really really great takes on the clock trees not even on one of the characters but on the <laughs> clock trees um, uh which are just very very beautiful and if i had the courage of my convictions that would be my tattoo um uh that's what i would get uh there's a um, really uh, uh, it's an incredible um, uh, uh, painting that I wish that I had here. Oh, it's a couple of really incredible uh, paintings. Um, uh, um, <laughs> there's one of um, Sir uh, Prickleplump, a very deep cut, which you know, I know which I myself it took me a second when I saw it to think where does that where does that fit in exactly? <laughs> um, it's it's mentioned one time as something that was in the uh, the Fillory books the plover books uh but someone did a real epic paint painting of, of uh, sir pickle pump which um oh. is hanging uh, um i don't have it in sydney it's hanging in my house in brooklyn um oh. but it's just <laughs> so cool <laughs> it's beyond anything like uh uh it's just the most beautiful thing did you did someone send it to you or did you like stumble upon it online and like buy it they mailed it to me i would have bought it for a lot of money but um <laughs> they just they uh, um they they actually just sent it to me in the mail and that's nice. Uh, uh, it's one of my um, most treasured things that I own. I love that so much. Yeah, that's um, a... Go ahead, I was just gonna say there's and and with Fillory, like even a lot of to the imagery too. There's a lot of like Narnia, yeah, sure, but there's also like Oz and like the Phantom Tollbooth, and and none of it is like it's not. It's so it feels so fresh, and yet things like the clock trees, I'm like that has existed in my mind forever. <laughs> it's mine now. Um, and I wonder like, you know, did what was your, or what is your relationship with Fillory from like, a, what's the, what's the word that it sort of like all comes from for you? Like it, like for Narnia, hmm. there's like a sort of fairy tale esque quality for Fillory. Is, it, is there, is there like a place it comes from? Hmm. Um, uh, you know, it's funny, um, in the, in the, uh, um, uh, Magician's Nephew, when they go to the wood between the worlds, um, they, uh, I'm going to mangle the quote, but one of them <laughs> says, uh, uh, about it that, um, there, there was something really rich about it, like a, I think he says like a plum pudding, um, something about it, the air is just really, the colors. Um, it's just very rich, and and um, I think it's the word that I uh, that for me I think of um, uh, with um, with Fillory. It's kind of oh, it would be sort of ultra real, like hyper saturated. Um, if you went there, it would be sort of realer than real. Hmm. Um, I always uh, pictured it as kind of like like when Dorothy opens the door and she goes into Technicolor, but. It's not that it's like it's like the level of detail or like or like when you see they turn really crazy graphics cards up with ray tracing and stuff and suddenly everything <laughs> glistens a little bit like yeah. and that's how I always pictured it. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. <laughs> um, Lev, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a delight chatting with you. So um, awesome. I am excited for us to start covering the show. Um, mm. It's been cool hearing our listeners kind of like half and half. I will say they were like the three of us talk about magicians so much <laughs> while talking about Buffy that a lot of them were like, oh, well, you talked about it so much. So I, I did watch the show, like <laughs> I ended up watching and reading it. Um, and in our discord, I like mentioned that we were talking to you and people were very excited. Um, so I am happy that even this many years later, you are still down to talk about 
your book series <laughs> and the show. <laughs> anytime, anytime. It is such, it is such, such a pleasure. Um, and I feel like you guys know the books as well as I do. Um, <laughs> uh um uh and it's well it's just like a special pleasure um and here's the cameo we've been waiting for yes yes um, esme <laughs> um uh, uh it's a real joy um, <laughs> and i hope you'll I, I hope you'll uh um uh uh have you on the show sometime um yes oh totally once point. i read your new book i'm gonna have to <laughs> pick you apart over um but let everyone know where they can find you online and Pre-order your book, maybe, or order your books. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, you, know, you can order my books from uh, bookshop.org. Is the is the site that I always, I personally order my books from. Uh, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of it. Um, uh, and you used to be able to find me on Twitter, and you still can. Um, but I'm sort of spread thinly over that and Threads and Blue Sky, and occasionally on Mastodon. Uh, I need to, I need to sort my um, my internet presence out. Um, uh, uh, but you know, that's where I, that's, that's where I am. I'm on Instagram. I'm, I'm a, the worst in spammer of all time, but I am there. <laughs> um, so come find me. I did. I did when the boom hit of like Twitter was kind of fallen. I signed up for all the other ones and then I like never use them. Yeah, you don't no, have I to know. work yourself out. The <laughs> internet needs to work itself out. You just that's sit true. right where you are. <laughs> Somebody get on Blue Sky and follow me because I'm like the least popular person. On Blue Sky. But I am there. I'm on Mastodon. I'll find you on Mastodon. <laughs> oh my God. I, you, you'll be follower like three. For me on there. <laughs> uh, I will find you from Slayer Fest, uh, Blue Sky <laughs> and Threads. Um, cool. But yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you all for listening. And um, we will see you next time. This is the start of our magicians coverage and uh, we're going to be going weekly. So bye.